Marine Corps films of the advance on Motobu Peninsula, Okinawa, in a drive to clear the northern sector of the island. A Jap plane attacks our troops. One of our fighter planes brings down the enemy after a short dogfight. of the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions encounter scattered enemy opposition in their drive northward. The advance toward Hado Cape, Okinawa's northern tip, is slowed down only by the difficult terrain and the poor road system of this area. East and west coast units maintain a continuous line of progress across the island, and first patrols reach the Cape 14th April. Marines, supported by armored units, approach a village. Sniper fire is encountered from Japs hidden in houses. Our troops quickly wipe out the snipers and secure the village. A Japanese soldier surrenders. After completion of the northern campaign, Marines join 24th Army Corps troops in the drive on southern Okinawa. On the southern Okinawa front, 24th Army Corps troops move forward against powerful Japanese resistance, which has slowed down our advance in this sector. A new offensive is supported by naval gunfire and preceded by one of the heaviest artillery barrages of the Pacific War. Phosphorus smoke screen to mark vital targets and cover our attack is laid down by the artillery. Bombing by land and carrier-based planes softens up Jap emplacements. Elements of the 382nd Infantry, 96th Division, attack Jap positions on tabletop ridge. Japanese defenses in southern Okinawa, centered in a series of hills and ridges, are organized in depth and developed to fully exploit the defensive value of the terrain. While under heavy fire from Jap mortars, medics remove the wounded from Tabletop Ridge. The wounded are placed in a weasel and transferred to a field hospital. Fighting for Kakazu Ridge near the island's west coast, Tank units support troops of the 381st Infantry, 96th Division, attacking strongly defended enemy positions on the ridge. Flushing out a Jap civilian found hiding in a hillside cave. Blowing up one of the deep fortified caves. Flame-throwing tanks of the 713th Tank Battalion lead the attack on Sawtooth Ridge, another stubbornly defended hillside position. Flamethrowers attempt to burn out jets hidden in caves, burial vaults, and underground tunnels and emplacements. of the 382nd Infantry, 96th Division, move up the ridge to clean out individual pillboxes and pockets. Despite bombing and intensified tank, mortar, artillery, and naval gun shelling, the enemy resists all efforts to break down his defenses. The Jap is deeply dug in on the reverse side of the slopes, where he can't be reached by direct fire. Tanks pace the 184th Infantry advance against Rocky Crag Ridge. Mortars lay down a protective barrage for the tanks. A tank team goes into battle for the ridge. Present tactics call for tank teams composed of armored units and infantrymen to move ahead of the general infantry advance. Bitter fighting rages on Rocky Crag Ridge. Three times our troops attempt to gain the hill only to be driven back by intense artillery fire.
One of our tanks is knocked out by a direct hit. The other tanks withdraw. Wounded men of the knocked out tank are evacuated from the ridge. Tanks used in this attack mounted 75 and 105 millimeter guns. While on the alert for hidden Japanese snipers, our troops inspect various types of enemy defenses found in the hills and ridges of southern Okinawa. The elaborate defensive system consists of concrete pillboxes, fortified tunnels, spider caves, block houses, and interconnecting open and closed trenches. The terrain provides excellent natural cover for these dug-in positions, and the slowness of our progress has been due to the necessity of destroying them one by one. A tank trap. Such traps and unusually heavy concentrations of mortars and artillery have caused high tank losses. A plane carrying Admiral Chester W. Nimitz and Marine General Vandegrift arrives at an Okinawa airport. The Admiral greets staff officers at the field. Admiral Nimitz and General Vandegrift plan an inspection of Okinawa battlefronts and visits to command posts of the 77th Division and 10th Army Headquarters. Dawn on 26th March, 300 Japanese staged a surprise attack on several CB areas along the west shore of Iwo Jima. Where the Japs came from was not known. Many had GI guns and equipment. Using infiltration tactics, they approached our tents in the dark, knifed a number of the guards and were preparing to attack several of the units simultaneously when a sentry opened fire. As the men rushed out of their tents, some of the Japs maintained fire from behind cover. Others stormed the tents, ripping them open to toss in grenades or entering swords in hand. In two hours, the Marines wiped out all 300 Japs with Tommy guns, grenades, and flamethrowers. Our casualties came to about 100, including a number of newly arrived pilots spending their third night on EO. Seizing another island in Manila Bay, men of the 592nd Amphibious Engineers move in for a landing on Carabao Island on the morning of 16th April. The landing is unopposed. Land-based artillery near Cavite had bombarded the island for several days. The preliminary artillery fire concentrated on knocking down an eight-foot seawall to enable the men to get ashore. The troops head for high ground. Intelligence reports stated that Carabao was manned by a garrison of 322 men who for months had been extending underground ammunition tunnels for a defensive stand. The Japs open fire. Under cover of machine guns, our troops advance toward the tunnel entrances. Fire is poured into an entrance while demolition men prepare to seal it with a TNT charge. Ammunition rooms leading to the tunnels are sealed off, ending all resistance. Fascines for use on M4 tanks. Fascines were developed for crossing natural and prepared tank obstacle ditches in the Po River Valley. They are made by fastening medium-sized logs around oil drums. M4 tanks are converted into fascine carriers by fitting the turret with a special carrying device, which can be revolved in any direction. The dikes on the side of an obstacle ditch are breached so that armored vehicles can pass. Then the fascine is dropped into the ditch opposite the breach. Under tank pressure, the logs on the oil drums roll back and forth, distributing the weight. The arc, a second device developed for crossing tank obstacle ditches. 
It's made by removing the turret and fitting on a folding treadway bridge. The dike on the side of an obstacle ditch is leveled. The arc advances into the ditch opposite the leveled area. The arms of the bridge are lowered from inside the tank until they rest on either bank, forming a stable means of crossing. The third device used for crossing obstacle ditches is the treadway bridge on a dolly. A medium tank pushes the dolly bridge into position over the ditch, then crosses without stopping. Nazi V-bomb over Antwerp. Since the war has ended in Europe, it's possible to reveal the great menace which has hung over this main Allied port since its liberation last November. Bombs fell throughout Antwerp, from the dock area to crowded neighborhoods of homes and shops. But the vital flow of supplies was not halted. The population of Antwerp suffered severe losses in life and homes. Yet when the Battle of the Bulge last December once more threatened their freedom, the Belgians said, we can stand the buzz bombs, but we couldn't stand the Germans here again. they shot down. Allied raids on launching sites helped deliver the final crushing blow to the V-bomb menace. along the edge of an airfield marks the supply area of the 490th Quartermaster Depot Company, the only air quartermaster group in the ETO. This airfield in England was the source of all supplies flown across the channel to help equip Allied troops in their drive across France and into Germany. Bomb dispersal bays near the airfield were used for supply dumps. The men prepared thousands of supply bundles in special aerial containers which were packed so expertly that even delicate medical supplies could withstand the shock of being dropped from the air. They also packed the cargo parachute which is attached to every bundle, loaded the C-47 carriers, flew the planes and acted as drop masters for the equipment. An aerial container weighs from 200 to 300 pounds when loaded. The attached parachute weighs 25 pounds. Two men handle the heavy packages which are specially designed to carry the maximum load the parachute will support. After being packed, packages are loaded on trucks and transported to the carrier planes. From D-Day to 31st December, the company loaded this huge C-47s with almost 120 million pounds of supply, including ammunition, guns, oil, tank tracks, armor plating, signal equipment, rations and medical supplies. A medic truck carrying containers of blood plasma drives up to a waiting C-47. Both plasma and whole blood were flown across the channel and dropped to medical units in the field. Additional medical equipment included distilled water, first aid dressings and morphine. The supplies presented a wide range of loading and lashing problems. Center of gravity had to be determined for every plane and the lashing made to guard against forward, backward, or upward motion under any conditions, including crash landings. As many as five plane loads of different supplies were set up at each point stake. 
When aircraft were loaded from these points, the loads were immediately replaced from the reserve stocks in the bomb dispersal bays, thus eliminating all delay. Hundreds of C-47s were shuttled back and forth across the channel to supply the swiftly moving Allied armies. As many as 200 planes have been loaded during a 24-hour period. These air supply missions aided materially in the invasions of Normandy and Holland and relieved encircled American garrisons at Mortain and Bastogne. Among the last great air raids of the European war is the attack on the island fortress of Helgoland, which guards the approaches to Hamburg and Bremen. Naval and gun installations and the airfield on nearby Duna Island are pounded by the RAF. The attack on Hitler's Berchtesgarten retreat in the Bavarian Alps Lancasters, with American and British fighter escort, dropped their bombs on the white-painted chalet, the SS barracks, and the nearby hideout atop the Kaelstein crag. In addition to large numbers of 1,000 and 4,000 pound bombs, the RAF uses 12,000 pound bombs fused for deep penetration. Photo reconnaissance reveals extensive damage at the Nazi Alpine Sanctuary. Capture of Bremen, Germany's third largest port, brings the first close-up view of the vaunted Nazi submarine pens. Sixteen U-boats are captured intact. In addition, various sections ready for assembly are uncovered. These parts were made in converted safe factories and are designed so that only minor adjustments are necessary to complete the construction. Two breathers enable the subs to charge their batteries without surfacing. A worldwide U-boat roundup is now underway. The first undamaged jet plane to be captured in the European war. It's an ME-262 with a top speed of 600 miles per hour and normally carries two 500-pound bombs. Armament consists of four 30 millimeter cannon. Provision is made in the nose tip for larger caliber cannon. The historic meeting of the American and Russian forces at the Elba. Linking of the Western and Eastern fronts in Germany is initiated by a patrol of the 69th Infantry Division on a blown up bridge across the Elba at Torgau. Following this first informal Russo-American meeting, Major General Reinhardt, the 69th commander, leads an American party in extending an official handshake to the Russian command in the Torgau area. Both the American and British flags are carried by our troops in this 26th April ceremony. displaying the improvised American flag used by the original patrol to help establish its identity. Spontaneous celebrations are staged by the soldiers of both armies. The Russians dance with American women correspondents. In a festive mood, they drink toasts to each other and to their victorious link-up. The meeting precedes by only 10 days the final unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany. The dead are ready for burial at Belsen concentration camp. Liberated inmates give vocal expression to their long pent up feelings as the SS guards are forced to unload the corpses. At Belsen, the British troops found 60,000 dead, dying and starving men, women and children. Filth and degradation and disease highlight the eyewitness reports from Belsen. The higher Sturmfuhrer commanding this camp coldly described the inmates as antisocial, useless people whom he clearly regarded as cattle.
one of the SS women. A speech from the British Commandant. The Commandant's speech is read for the camp guards and for a group of local civic officials who are compelled to view the atrocities. Beginning by reminding them that the British have been here for 10 days and therefore the conditions shown are not one half as bad as they were while this camp was in German hands, the Commandant says, what you will see provides a final condemnation of the Nazi party. It contains a complete justification of any measures the Allied nations may take to extirpate this party. It constitutes such a blot on the name of the German people as to erase it from the list of civilized nations. First-hand testimony is offered by members of the British Occupation Group. I am the Reverend T.J. Stretch, attached as padre to the formation controlling this camp. My home is at Fishguard. My parish was at Holy Trinity Church, Aberystwyth. I've been here eight days, and never in my life have I seen such damnable ghastliness. This morning, we buried over 5,000 bodies. We don't know who they are. Behind me, you can see a pit which will contain another 5,000. There are two others like it in preparation. All these deaths have been caused by systematic starvation and typhus and disease, which have been spread because of the treatment meted out to these poor people by their SS guards and their SS chief. My name is Colonel Ellingworth, and I live at Cheshire. I'm at present in Belsen Camp doing guard duty over the SS men. The things in this camp are beyond describing. When you actually see them for yourself, you know what you're fighting for here. Pictured in the paper, cannot describe it at all. The things they have committed, well, nobody would think they were human at all. We actually know now what has been going on in these camps. And I know, personally, what I'm fighting for. This Polish woman, herself an inmate, was the chief doctor of the camp while it was in German hands. In explaining the almost complete absence of food, she says, hunger was so terrible that among the male prisoners, many cut liver, heart, and lungs from the dead and ate those parts. The SS did not give us any medical supplies, she says. The SS men had collected food through the year, which was sent to us prisoners by the Red Cross. Two days before the British Army arrived, the guards unpacked the parcels for distribution, as they did not want the British to know they had been withholding them. She tells of medical experiments with inmates as guinea pigs, and of gasoline injections which caused death within a few minutes. And finally, how the youngest and most beautiful of the girl inmates were sterilized. In the Bohemia Forest near the Czech frontier are the remains of those murdered by the Nazis after evacuation from the Buchenwald concentration camp. Amid the battered corpses, a Polish boy recognizes the body of his father. Civilians from the nearby town of Neuenburg, men, women and children, are ordered to provide 161 coffins for the burial of the victims. On this Sunday morning, 29th April, they will carry the coffins from the hillside to the town, three quarters of a mile away. They will pass through the streets and thence to the cemetery on the outskirts of Nuremberg. The lids are off the coffin so that the 2,500 townspeople can see the gruesome bodies. It is directed that religious services be held at the cemetery and all must attend. These are American soldiers just three days after their release from German PW camps. Two of the men explain what they had to endure while prisoners of the Nazis. My name is Shelby Rich. I am from Chicago, Illinois. I was captured on December 19th in the Battle of the Bulge. Upon being captured, 
the group that I was with was forced to march for 180 miles with virtually no food at all. Upon arriving at our destination and being registered as prisoners of war, we were forced to go out on working parties for the Germans and to work for them somewhere in Germany. Upon arriving at this work party, we were expected to carry 220 pound sacks, one per man, and also to unload coal cars carrying 70 ton of coal, two men to unload it in two hours. We received very little food, two bowls of very watery soup and a small bread ration a day. Some of the men were not able to do this type of work on the food they were receiving. And upon not being able to, they were hit with rifle butts by the guards. I myself at one time, because I was not able to do the work, was hit with a brick thrown by one of the guards. We were also promised to get paid and to receive cigarette rations from the Germans. I saw none of this while I was a prisoner of war in Germany. My name is Charles J. Short. I'm from Akron, Ohio. I was captured in the Battle of the Bald, December 19, 1944. After making us walk for about 40 miles, I believe our worst experience was being packed on a small boxcar, 60 men to one car. During this time, we had received absolutely nothing to eat. After we had gotten on the boxcar, we received about this amount of bread, a one day's ration. Occasionally, we got a bucket of water to drink. We were never allowed off of the cars for the eight days and eight nights that we were on. After we arrived at our working commando, things were not so quite so bad, but we were always hungry for the whole five months. We never did have enough to eat. In two months' time after being captured, I myself lost 55 pounds. I lost four inches off my waist. My pulse went from 78 to 60 beats per minute. Benito Mussolini returns to Milan, birthplace of Italian fascism. His body lies where it was dumped in the Piazza Loreto alongside are the remains of his 25-year-old mistress, Signorina Clara Patacci, and 16 other fascists, many of them members of Mussolini's cabinet. All were executed after being captured while trying to flee the Milan area by way of Lake Como. The bodies are kicked and stepped upon despite the efforts of the armed partisans to hold off the enraged crowds. During the demonstrations, shots are fired in the air and hoses sprayed on the people to keep them back. that when sentence was passed by the trial committee composed of personnel from the 52nd Garibaldi Brigade and an officer of the Milan Partisan Command, Mussolini cried, let me save my life and I will give you an empire. When the firing squad was about to shoot, Mussolini cried, no, no. Those were his last words. Now the bodies are hung by their feet at a gasoline filling station in the piazza. This is a treatment sometimes accorded Italian criminals. bodies are later removed to the city morgue. This final chapter in the life of the man who ruled Italy for more than 20 years is to end in a pauper's grave at Milan.